Hello, welcome to this webinar offered through Dairy Extent, which is a national e-extension resource. My name is Kathy Lee. I am an extension educator with Michigan State University and I'll be today's moderator. The title of today's webinar is Effective Manage Management of Farm Employees. It will be presented by Phil Durst and Stan Moore of Michigan State University Extension. Phil started his extension career with Penn State Cooperative Extension and has now worked for MSU Extension since 1997. Phil's current extension programming has an emphasis on cattle health. Most re recently, he has been involved in projects, research, and education on Yoni's disease, bovine leukosis, and mastitis. Phil also coordinates two young dairy producer peer groups in Northeast Michigan. Stan Moore has served with MSU Extension for 22 years in various roles, including Agricultural Educator and County Extension Director. He currently works as the Extension Dairy Educator in the Northwest area of the Lower Peninsula of Michigan and provides statewide expertise in agriculture human resource management. He has authored and co-authored several agricultural labor resources. Currently, Phil and Stan are involved in a multi-state project on using employee feedback to improve employee management on dairy farms. Today, they will share some of the results from that project. Phil and Stan, at this time, I turn over the program to you. We look forward to learning about effective employee management. Good afternoon. We're, uh, we're glad to talk with you today about effective management of farm employees. And for those of you who are with us live and those of you who, who will be joining us by recorded video, recorded webinar, we're glad to have you along. Well, the issue of effective management of farm employees is one that's growing in importance because on many farms, it's employees who are doing the day-to-day -day work of the cows. So as we manage dairies today, we're really managing employees because it's employees who are doing the, the, the milking, who are doing the feeding, and they're responsible for cattle health. They're responsible for product quality. They're responsible for cattle well-being. These things are in their ballpark now, and as managers, we're managing people to manage cows. Well, a little bit about the project that Phil and I have been involved with. This started back in 2012. Uh, we're still ongoing with the project. As you'll, as you'll see later, we've got some new numbers to share, uh, even based on the number of employees that have come through. So uh, this project originally started with a North Central Risk Management Grant. And what we did was we used input of farm employees to help improve employee management on that farm. That was our goal. That's our idea, is that we can use that input. We developed a survey. We utilized that survey tool with employees on project farms. We gave them a copy of that survey so that they would kind of know what questions they were going to be asked by the interviewer, but then they would call in anonymously to a bilingual interviewer and provide feedback on the farm. The survey was about 29 questions long. We also asked employers what they thought their employees would say so that we could compare perceptions versus how the employees really felt. We then would develop a report based on that input. We would provide recommendations back to the farm based on the transcripts that were sent by the interviewer. We'd sit down on the farm with the owners and managers to review the results. The purpose of the project is to help employers learn to manage employees better based on things the employees told us. Learn to help and engage employees more based on what employees have reported back to us. And then not only working with those project farms, but then like we're doing today, to use that knowledge that we've learned to help other farms as well. So I'll give you a few more details on the project. Uh, besides Phil and I working on this project, we involved a partner, Felix Soriano from APN Consulting, Inc. Felix is in the north east coast part of the U.S. and was able to engage and enroll some farms from out in that area as well. Today, we have 14 farms that we've worked with in four states with a total of 230 employees. Of those 230 employees, 174 called in to our interviewer. That interviewer has been the same throughout the duration of the project, and we feel that's an important um, part of the re this research project is that we did involve the same interviewer 
uh, because we're asking her to type those employee responses, we want to make sure that we're consistent there. And then finally, you know, one of the things that we see initially from the data is that, you know, every farm is different. We're unique. Employers are unique. Managers are unique. But there are some common themes that arise, some common important lessons that we can learn. Here's the, the take-home message. So early in the presentation, we're giving you the bottom line. And that is that farms vary widely in, in employee turnover rate and that farms vary widely in employee management, employee engagement, pardon me, and that management makes a difference. So there's a big difference in employee turnover rate, a big difference in engagement, and it's management that makes a difference in this. Now, what is this employee turnover rate? How is it we figure that? What does it matter? And what is the range? We calculate employee turnover rate as the number of, of people hired in a year divided by the number of positions on the farm. So for example, let's say a farm has 20 employee positions and they hired 10 people. Well, 10 over 20 is 50% employee turnover rate. Now, let's take a different farm. Let's say a different farm hired 25 people in that year for 20 positions. Their employee turnover rate is 125%. That is that even though there's only 20 positions, some of those positions may have turned very rapidly. Some of those employees may have stayed a very short time, and therefore their employee turnover rate was very high. Why does that matter? Well, because employees who are there longer develop knowledge and skills specific to that farm, develop knowledge and skills specific to, da to dairy. Employees need to be there a length of time in order to develop those knowledge and skills. And then as they're there longer, they develop t better teamwork with their coworkers and consistency of routines. When there's turnover, it disrupts employee function on the farm, there's a high cost to turnover, and it has an impact on morale. What we found from these 14 farms was a range in turnover from single digits to triple digits. That's an incredible range from less than 10% to greater than 100% turnover on some dairy farms. Just as we have seen a big range in employee turnover, we also see a big range in employee engagement. Well, what do we mean by engagement? Well, Charles Contreras of People First put it this way. Engagement is a connection between an employee and employer which results in that employee giving voluntary effort. We really like that definition. Voluntary effort, really when the employee gives of themselves uh, in, in this way, it's, in a gift, it's a gift to the business. It's a gift to the employer. Well, we answered that question uh, or asked that question in indirectly by saying, how often do you come up with ideas to improve the operation, you as an employee? And then we categorize those responses. Because it was an open-ended question, we categorized them as frequently, occasionally, or this third category, which we would call disengaged, is those employees that said, I just do what they tell me to do. Or they say, I have ideas, but I don't share them. Oftentimes, that last comment is a result of employees that are disengaged because of employer feedback to them. We then took that number and said, Let's calculate a percentage of those employees that are disengaged. Well, why does this matter? Well, a mind engaged means that they're thinking about what they're doing. They're likely to make fewer mistakes if they're thinking about what they're doing. They're likely to make better decisions if they're thinking about what they're doing. And they're really seeking to benefit the business. What it really tells us is how management how management is on that farm. It reveals that ad to the managers towards employees. Because when employees are making comments to us saying, well, they think my ideas are stupid, or I don't want to tell it too many more because they say they just do it their own way anyways, then really that management has uh, is, is it bad in a way that it's not acknowledging that gift that employees are trying to give. Well, what's the range? The range that we seen was from 8 to 56%. In other words, on some farms, over half of the employees are disengaged, according to this definition. Now, some producers will say, 
Well, if I could just hire the right employees, as if that was the answer. Wrong. Because what we've learned is that the difference between farms, the difference in turnover, the difference in engagement, are not primarily differences in the employee pool. It's not the employees that are making the difference. It's the employers that are making the difference. Yes, you need to hire well. That's important, to hire employees well. But you need to develop those whom you hire. Now, through our work, we've learned, we learned five keys for developing employees. The first of those keys is focus employees on achieving performance standards. We asked employees to tell us to rate how familiar they are with farm goals, and then to tell us three goals that they remembered. Unfortunately, employees did very poor in this. That is, they may have said they knew farm goals, but they were very nonspecific in what they said goals were, or the goals that they said were nonspecific, were not measurable, were not something they could ever tell whether they reached or not. And so we think, and we also asked employers to tell us farm goals. And we believe that it's a, the problem is that owners and managers often have difficulty in setting and specifying goals. And that leaves employees without good direction. And yet, for employees to be full team members, they need to know both the goal or the key performance indicator and the performance against that goal. So employers need to set and communicate standards, key performance indicators. And every employee, employee should be working toward a set, two or three, key, key performance indicators in their area of the operation. A second way that we can develop employees is to provide opportunities for them to learn. We asked employees, how would you rate your interest in learning? We also asked employers, how do you think your employees would respond to that question of how they would rate their interest in learning? The responses ranged from one, which is, I know enough to do my job, or I already know enough to do my job, to five, which says, I'm interested in dairy and I want to keep learning. Well, employees rated that at, as a 4.73. And that was pretty consistent across farms. They want to learn. They want to learn more. They want to learn why they're doing what they're doing. We asked employers what they thought their employees would say. They said 3.27. Well, that's more than, that's like a point and a half almost difference between those. And it really points out that, you know, they think their employees are kind of good with where they're at, you know. They're kind of that medium category, you know, don't, don't know too much, but don't want to learn a lot. Well, so employers underestimate the desire of employees to learn. They also need to provide learning opportunities that are progressive. You can't do the same milker training year after year for that employee that's been there five or six years. It needs to be progressive. They want to know why. Let's teach them the why of what they're doing, especially for those employees that have been around for a while. We need to value that portion of the employee that is above the shoulders, their mind. We had one farm that put it this way, thinking employees are better employees. They're more likely to be engaged. A third way that we can develop employees is to provide regular feedback to employees. Phil talked about KPIs, key performance indicators. That can be the basis for our feedback. That should be the basis for our feedback. So how is that employee, how is that team doing against those key performance indicators. Let them know how they're doing. Let them know how you want it to be done or what goals should be out there. It needs to be specific, and not only for the individual, but as well as for the team. So um, it also needs to be positive, negative, or redirective. We can't just give negative feedback. We asked employees how often they got feedback. They said quite a bit. And then we asked them, well, positive or negative? Negative all the time. Positive never. Well, we need to provide positive feedback. But it needs to be more than just add a boy, add a girl. And then we need to create opportunities for feedback. We can't just expect that they're going to come up. As managers, we need to think about how, what are good times that I can provide feedback. For instance, a paycheck. If we're given a paycheck every two weeks, that's a great opportunity to say, here's how we're doing as a farm. Here's how you contributed to that. Thank you. 
The fourth area of developing employees is to facilitate and encourage better teamwork. The labor management serve, uh, database, the industry or the, the combined knowledge of labor management tells us many times that employees leave a job to leave an employer. Okay, we know that. Sometimes people want to leave their boss. But what we've learned in this project is that sometimes employees want to leave other employees. And that's a critical aspect of this that we really need to, to remember, that employees need to be able to work together as a team. If not, they may leave. We may lose good employees because they're leaving fellow employees. And so as an employer, as a manager, we need to create opportunities for employees to work together to communicate with each other provide opportunities for reporting communicating between shifts and don't allow one shift to blame the next. Don't allow there to become divisions between the group. Emphasize the need to support one another, to help one another. It's one team. It's the farm team. It's not the milker shift versus that milker shift. It's not the cow, milk, the cow employees versus the field employees. It's one team, the farm team. The fifth area of developing employees is to give responsibility and authority to employees. To encourage their ideas for input, to encourage them to come up with recommendations, to encourage them to even make decisions on the farms. We need to involve them as a part of working together for the betterment of the operation to reach the goals of the operation. And so employees need to have the responsibility and authority to make those decisions. And then we need to help them analyze those decisions and make sure that they become better at those decisions in the future. Now, for many farms these days, one of the overarching issues, it's come from the fact that we have a, a diverse uh, employee population are the language and cultural barriers that arise because of that. And we know that the language barriers may be between employer and employees and employees. That barrier can isolate employees. It can make them feel like they have no way to express themselves and no way to learn more. And as employees are isolated, they become disengaged. Language matters. You know, we can get by sometimes with cursory language skills or cursory language uh, helps where we tell somebody what to do or, or to go there or do this. But that's not deep enough in order to develop an employee. We need to have better language skills in order to develop employees. And language and culture can be as much of a barrier between employees as between employees and managers themselves. And yet if it's going to be one team, team firm, they need to be able to understand and communicate with each other. Well, how, what are some options for overcoming these barriers? Well, one of the things that uh, farms can look at is language lessons. But oftentimes we think about language lessons for the manager, owners, learn a few Spanish words, that type of thing. And certainly Spanish language uh, courses for those English speaking, uh, both managers and employees and employees is a great thing. But how about also English language courses for our Spanish speaking employees? Again, goes back to that, you know, do they have a desire to learn? And oftentimes what we see is they would like to learn some English so they can better communicate. Well, another way is to provide an outside interpreter and schedule that on a regular basis. We emphasize outside because we've seen on farms, occasionally you, you rely too much on just that one employee that, know, needs, that knows how to speak English and Spanish well. They become the translator, but in effect, they become the gatekeeper as well. That can lead to some issues on farms. Uh, it can be a great benefit. It can really hurt you too. So getting that outside interpreter in there is a good idea on a regular basis. And they need to provide interpretation both from you to the employees, but not just telling them what to do, having a conversation, also getting feedback from them. Of course, there's some great technologies out there for those spur-of-the-moment things where you need to get a point across, like Google Translate, iTranslate, all kinds of programs like that. Uh, what we're trying to do in breaking down those language and cultural barriers is to facilitate human living. 
as Phil said, we see way too many farms where we talk with the employees and they feel very isolated. They need a life outside of work. Sometimes as owners and managers, we can mistakenly interpret that as, well, they just want more hours. They, you know, they love working 17 hours a day. Well, it may be because they don't have anything else to do. And we'd like to encourage farms to create some opportunities for them to have a life outside of work. We've seen farms do soccer, basketball, other farm activities, family activities uh, that can involve that employee and really make them feel part of the group. Another aspect of language and cultural barriers is even within your own language group. Just because you speak the same language does not mean you're communicating. If you've ever raised teenagers, you're well aware of this fact. And so we understand that communication is broader than just overcoming language and cultural barriers. It really is about connecting with somebody and having them connect with you. Now, if we rely on written training protocols or written SOPs for, for tasks and assume that our employees can read those, we may be making too broad of an assumption. And it may be that we need to provide literacy training for employees. Keep that in mind because they're unlikely to mention that to you. They're unlikely to tell you if they can't read. And then the other thing, when we talk about training employees, we often use this formula. Tell them, show them, tell me, show me. It's a formula where we, we, we tell them what we wanted to do. We then demonstrate that for them, have them tell us back what the steps are, and then have them show us or demonstrate that procedure to us so that we know that we've communicated with them. Well, we've shared with you some of the things that we've learned in this project, and that is that employee engagement and turnover vary greatly between farms, and that management makes a difference. Employee management matters. And some people will say, well, that's not how I'm naturally gifted. I'm not naturally a good communicator. That may be true. But that can't be used as an excuse. It's a skill to be developed. Management is a skill that people can learn and that we need to work on learning. And if we don't have those natural inclinations, it may take more work and more learning. But management can increase engagement and management can decrease employee turnover. And those are the building blocks of a better business. Well, thanks for your participation today. And we'd be glad to take your questions as we uh, continue this discussion with you. So the first question we have that's been typed in is, are, are any money incentives a good idea? And what about penalties? You know, we've, in, we've seen incentives work well and not work well. Um, I'm, I'm not a big fan of penalties. <laughs> uh, we would like to keep things positive, um, you know, not have to use the stick if we, if we don't have to. I think one of the keys that we've seen with incentives is we need to think through the process of what we create an incentive for and then make sure that there's not unintended consequences for that. So just a real simple example, somatic cell count. You know, we can give a, a lot of farms, that's where we, they would give an incentive. Um, and oftentimes it works great. But think about some of the potential downsides of that. So, well, I could just throw away a bunch of milk and get the somatic cell count down lower, right? So we need to create some balancing key performance indicators. We'd like to see maybe three uh, key performance indicators that balance each other out. So not only does SMAC cell count need to be lower, but new infection rate also has to be lower. Uh, some things to counteract each other or else the incentive thing can get, uh, you know, can create some problems. I would say this too, Stan, that as, as we should reevaluate, probably on an annual basis, our key performance indicators and what they're set at, we should also reevaluate re when incentives kick in. Because if we set a, 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 a key performance indicator today that, at which a, a incentive is paid, then hopefully we've progressed to the point where that's not needed in the future. That is, that that level is readily attained and we ought to be striving for a new level. So that we ought to set incentives only for the period of time, an annual period of time, I would right. say, that the KPIs are, are set for as well. Right. And, and involve employees in that conversation. You know, this is, is an opportunity to communicate. So I think one of the times that incentives fall down is that we set them and then everybody forgets about them. You know, we're meeting them all the time, so we're not talking about them anymore. 
um, you know, involve employees in not only setting the incentive that you know where the goal should be, but also in communicating with them on a regular basis. And then understand also that different employees w will uh, be able to have an effect on different things. And so your feeder may not have much of an effect on incentives, but your but he should have in KPIs that he or she is working toward that gives an incentive as well. So okay, someone thank asked. You. Oh. Thank you. Yeah, we the next question was um, you had mentioned that you had farms from four states involved in this project, and can you tell us which of those four states are? That's Michigan, Pennsylvania, New York, and Connecticut. Okay, thank you. Um, next comment and question. Employees not only work together, but many times they live together in farm housing. Is this a sustainable model for the future? Tom, that's, that's a great a question. Good question, Tom. <laughs> um, you know, we, we, well, we recently um, uh, went through a farm employee records that uh, six uh, Hispanic employees lived together, and um, that was all the Hispanic employees on that farm. That creates problems. It creates opportunities. It creates problems. And, and you know, I think that, that when we overdo something, we, we sow the seeds of, of failure. And I think we need to be careful about overcrowding, overdoing anything that, that houses them together. Six employees in one house uh, was probably too many in that house. And that creates problems that we'll see down the road at work, not just apart from work. Yeah, it really shows some of the assumptions that we can make about their culture, because uh, oftentimes we're doing that with Spanish-speaking employees. Um, w you know what their expectations are. Um, you know we to we need to make sure that they're we're treating them as human beings. Uh, some of the situations that uh, um, you know that that we're aware of. You know the housing is is probably not where it needs to be, um, and so I. I if you're looking at that type of situation, I would really encourage people to uh, cautiously look at that. I think there's probably a few farms that could do it well. Um, I don't know that I'd call it a, the sustainable model for the future, though, Tom. There are, there are requirements, as you well know, Tom, that if you're going to provide housing that, uh, that you run into uh, from a legal standpoint as well. Yeah. And that, that can't be ignored by employers who are providing housing. Yeah. I think it's more going to be the exception than the rule from what uh, what we're experiencing. So um, you've talked about the key performance indicators, and a question is asking if the standards are set based on industry standards or if they should actually be tailored for that individual farm. Well, I think the answer is, yes. in some ways, it's, <laughs> it's both, and that is that the standard part of that might be the areas that we're measuring. That is, for a milker, we might be measuring the rate of new infections, the somatic cell count, and maybe milking time. Mm -hmm. Those may be those may be standard, but the level for those, that is, what percent new infections we're dealing with, what somatic cell count, what milking time, those should be specific to the farm. And just like for a feeder, it could be the, the percents, oh, percent to accuracy the uh, the waste the, the time um, those ought to be individualized for the farm then based on, on what their uh, capabilities are yeah we wouldn't want to be setting standards based on like the industry average or something like that we want we certainly want to be better than average so uh, you know if we're really looking for progress on the farm we should be looking at maybe those indicators well what are the top 10 percent of farms doing and then still saying well, where do I think my farm should be? And I guess just to follow up on that, are, do you have some suggestions on, to farms on how to determine which one of those uh, key performance, or the, those three or four key performance indicators um, should be used for a group of employees? Um, are there, do you have suggestions on how to determine those or resources that they might uh, refer to? Well, we do think it needs to be job specific. Um, I think Phil mentioned that earlier. So that uh, you know, you really have to look at who can affect um, a particular trait. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't some that are broad enough that everybody affects. We were on one farm that uh, I believe it was smack cell count, wasn't it, Phil? That they 
every employee had some input on that because they thought, you know, hey, if we're feeding the cows well with a good nutritious diet, that's going to affect their ability to uh, withstand infection. So that one actually everybody keyed in on. But most of the indicators that we're looking at would be job specific. So a calf raiser mm -hmm. will have ones that relate to calf health, calf mortality, calf growth. I think those are areas that we would need to look at. Obviously, a milker, we're talking about issues related to mastitis and then things in the parlor themselves. Maybe it's compliance uh, with, with um, procedures, maybe it's time so that, again, we're not creating a lopsided effect. We want to make sure, as Stan said, that we don't create unintentional consequences by having just one indicator that then that becomes the most important thing and everything else feeds that yeah. to the to the detriment maybe of, of the operation. Yeah, if you, for instance, uh, Phil mentioned time, so turns per hour, you know, in the parlor obviously could have some enormously negative consequences if it's not held in check by something else. I know we could think get we a have lot a more specific on that, Kathy, but that's probably as far as No, that's, sure. nope, that, yeah, that's fine. Um, another question being typed in, but I think um, I had another question just in terms of the, the team teamwork um, item that you mentioned, and I don't know if you've found any um, things that that farms have done specifically that help uh, increase that connection among employees and create that team team atmosphere? Well, I think there's a couple of things um, that we've seen. One is, is a shift thing. So oftentimes there's problems between shifts and blaming uh, between shifts. So one of the things that farms can do is create opportunities for those shifts to communicate and also create maybe a lead person within that shift to to make sure that that communication is happening, um, you know, and pay the people to actually do that. So, you know, if you're going to ask an employee to stay over, uh, and a lot of, you know, nursing does this, for instance, my daughter's a nurse, and they, they stay over, and they communicate what's going on to the next shift, and, and they get paid to do that um, because they want that communication to happen. So that's one possibility is, is making sure that there's communication between shifts. Um, the other one would be that we've seen as a is a familial thing of you know we need to be careful as we're hiring employees. Oftentimes we we take referrals, which is great, uh, but we need to make sure that we're not creating a kind of the in group and the out group in that process. Um, and and a lot of that comes back to how effectively can we communicate uh, across cultures, across languages, to make sure that. Uh, employees are not developing camps um, and uh, you know really creating some uh, divisions there on your farm that you don't find out about until it's too late or until it's well along. And Kathy I'll just say this too I think that sometimes we've created situations on farms where shifts simply don't know each other. Mm -hmm. That employees leave, other employees come and, and, and you know if they know the names of the other employees that may be a big step but let's provide opportunities to work together me by crossing shifts, by giving people opportunities to work in other shifts, and also by social events outside of work that may give them opportunity to get to know each other as people. Because that's in, very important, to know each other as people, because then you work together better. OK, thank you. We have one more question um, before we conclude. Um, is the management a type of hierarchy with owner, barn manager, and down a pyramid-like structure? Or should we strive? to have employees more or less at the same level? Well, I think the answer to that actually is it depends. Mm -hmm. So, you know, often we do need to involve employees more than we're doing now in general as an industry. They should be more involved in the decision-making process. We should be looking to them for input, having those discussions. I think there are times, though, that, you know, the hierarchical structure is not totally bad. There are some conversations that you need to have as owner and managers that every employee doesn't need to know that you're wrestling with how you're going to transfer this to the next generation. So, uh, you know, I think it's it's a little bit of both, but definitely try to involve employees in more decisions. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that that we recognize is that in order to manage people, somebody shouldn't be managing probably more than 
seven or eight people. So that look at structures that enable that division to be able to uh, to manage smaller groups of employees and then have somebody in the next level manage those people as well. Mm -hmm. But even so, and, and this is the part where the hierarchical needs to, to be, to be uh, checked, the owner needs to set the tone for all the employees, not just for the next level of management. Mm -hmm. The owner needs to meet with employees and set the tone for, for work on that firm. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Phil and Stan. We appreciate the wealth of information that you shared with us. And I'd like to also uh, thank the audience again for your patience. And um, thank you for participating in today's discussion.